if you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word and open your Bibles to Paul's letter to the Romans. Our scripture reading this morning is Romans chapter 9, verses 22 through 26. Romans chapter 9, verses 22 through 26. The Apostle Paul says, What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and, who, <clears throat> and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. As we continue with our study, and praise the Lord, we, were, we are back in our main text after several weeks of an aside. We are in Colossians chapter 1, and for those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time today, welcome. We are glad you're here. Um, and in one sense, you are in a good spot as we jump back into our main study, because the last several weeks... We have looked back in the Old Testament in the past at the, the hidden mystery of God. Colossians 1 verse 26 says, The mystery which has been hidden in the past ages and generations. And we spent the last six weeks in that phrase, looking back throughout the Bible to see God's wonderful plan of salvation in Christ. The mystery of Christ. That was hidden. God's plan that was here from all time. God's plan was always from the very beginning of creation to save a people by the sacrificial death of His Son. And as we looked at that over the last six weeks, we come now to continue our study of Paul's letter to the Colossians with the end of verse 26 and verse 27 this morning. There Paul says, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We spent the last several weeks looking at the past. Now we start looking forward. Today's message we see the great hope, the glorious end to the plan of God, this working out, the manifestation of his glory. And for the last um, several weeks in our different Bible studies, I don't think I've said it in here, uh, maybe if I did one time. But as we approach the word of God, one thing I always want you to remember, every time you, you come to read the word of God or study the word of God on your own, we have to put something in our mind at the forefront. Why is this text here? What is God saying? Always, we need to focus ourselves and remind ourselves, the word that I'm reading, first and foremost, manifests God, God's glory, and God is making himself known. We see that in the text, um, in verse, at the end of 26 and 27, the manifestation to his saints and to whom God willed to make known. That's what God is always doing. That's what God has always been doing since the creation of the world. Manifesting his glory and making himself known. So at the beginning, if you take nothing else away from this morning's message, I want you to take that away. Because that is so important for your life. Every day to remind yourself. Not what your purpose is, per se. 
Not what your life is supposed to be doing, but what the Creator is doing, what God, the sovereign God of the universe, is doing, has been doing, and always will do for all eternity. But this morning, I just want to take a second, these two words of focus here, manifested and make known, before we go on. To manifest literally means to reveal or to make clear, to make visible, or to render apparent. So it's a revelation. To make known sounds kind of like the same thing, manifesting and making known. But there are actually two different Greek words here. Manifested is to reveal, to make known literally means to explain or to give understanding. So it, it, the best picture we can have is imagine a, a person who's been born blind, they've never seen a thing in their life, and all of a sudden they're able to have a, a surgery that restores their sight to them. So the manifestation is the first time they open their eyes and their eyes are exposed to light and they see everything around them, that's manifestation. Everything has been revealed to them. But as they've never, they, they know what things are in this world. They know what a table and a chair is. They know what a tree is. But they've never seen it, so they have to be explained what they're looking at. That's making it known. Okay, so we have a, re a revelation that is made known, and then a, a clarity and understanding that is given. That is the twofold purpose of God for us in our lives. God is always, always manifesting and making known in every part of life. Even the, even the aspects of life that we don't even know are going on. God is manifesting His glory and He's making Himself known. But the text says he's manifested this to his saints. And we'll talk about that in a second. But verse 27, to whom God will. I want to take a little another moment and just talk about the will of God for a second. This word for us as we read it is in the past tense. God will to make known the riches of his glory. And in a sense, we've looked at that the last several weeks with looking at the different covenants of God in the Old Testament that progressively reveal his plan. But God will this. And, and I don't want to get real technical. Um, and I'm not a Greek scholar by any stretch of the means. I'm not trying to impress you. But this word will is in the past, but it's active. But most importantly, it's singular. God doesn't have... A lot of wills. God has one will. God in his eternal simplicity, which is hard for us to fathom, but God is one God, and in his oneness, everything within him is one. God has one will. God has one plan. Now, to us, it's manifested because we're finite creatures, we don't have full understanding, we can't comprehend all the fullness of God. For to us, it's revealed as bits and pieces. But God's singular will is what has always been from all eternity. God doesn't have a will. God is will. Let me say that another way. God doesn't have attributes he is the sum total of his attributes. God doesn't have love. God is love. God doesn't have grace. He is grace. He doesn't have wisdom. He is wisdom. There's a difference there. We have attributes that we've been given. But we aren't those attributes. We are the sum total of those made up attributes. But God is one in his essence. He's one in his glory. He's one in his purpose. He is one in his will. God's will has always been done. What we see is the manifestation of that. So we have a revelation. We have God, a God that makes known his one will for us. And what is that one will? That one will comes to us this morning in four parts. If you, have, if you were able to have a study sheet or a little study guide, again, that's not comprehensive. My hope in providing that 
is primarily for you to go home with that and search the scriptures. Write little notes down here and there if you want to. Um, little reminders or questions. And if you have questions, you are welcome to come ask me. Okay? And, and part of that process is what we do on Sunday night. What we've been doing the last several Sunday nights going through this is not a separate Bible study, but an expansion of the morning service. I, I have this inkling within me that not every time we meet, it has to be a separate Bible study, okay? I, we need to meditate on God's Word. We need to chew on God's Word. It needs to sink in. We need to digest it. And so that's what Sunday night is, is, is about, taking the morning message and digesting it contemplating it, seeing all that God has fully, because I, if I put everything in the morning sermon, we'd be here for about two and a half hours, okay? And we Americans have an attention span because of YouTube that lasts about seven minutes, all right? So me preaching for 40 minutes, I, I'm taking a risk in and of itself with that. But <clears throat> there's four aspects here I want to look at of God. God's manifestation, and I just hinted a little bit in talking about the oneness of God, that every that God is who He is. So first, He manifests and make it, makes Himself known, and the Word of God gives us several of these things. The first one is, God is holy. He manifests His holiness. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 22 and 25 say this, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Sidon, and I will be glorified in your midst. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I execute judgments in her, and I will manifest my holiness in her. Now what God is talking about, he is talking about judging a nation that, ha that he has used to judge his nation of Israel. God is going to manifest his holiness in judgment but also in blessing to his people. Verse 25 says, Thus says the Lord God, and 22 he was speaking to Sidon, and, 22, and 25 he was speaking to his people. Thus says the Lord God, When I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, and I will manifest my holiness in them in the sight of the nations, then they will live in their land which I gave to my servant Jacob. God manifests his holiness his purity to not just his people, but to the whole world. And, and again, just like this word will was in the past but active, the manifestation of all of God's attributes are always active. This is not just a one-time event with Sidon and Israel that God displayed his holiness. He's always displaying his holiness to every nation. To every tribe, to every tongue, to every country, God is doing and displaying his purity. Secondly, his glory. John chapter 2 verse 11 says, This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Canaan of Galilee, speaking of turning the water into wine, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Everything Christ did was a manifestation of his glory. He's the eternal Son of God. So everything that he says, everything that he does, reveals who he is. God manifests and make himself, makes himself known through his name. John 17, 6. He makes himself known. Jesus himself in John 21, verses 1 and 14. He makes his righteousness known. In Romans 3, 21 through 22, Paul says, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. God's righteousness in what way? His righteousness in judgment and his righteousness in salvation and redemption. It spreads in, to every avenue of life. And thankfully, we can simplify it and under those two conditions of judgment and salvation. But in each and every little aspect of those things, his righteousness is made known. But it's through the law and through the prophets, through his holy word, the Old Testament. That's what's being referenced there. 
God manifests and make him, makes himself known through his knowledge, through his word in Titus 1.3. Paul says, but at the proper time, God manifested his word, the gospel. As we progressively move forward the last several weeks, looking at the mystery of Christ, Paul says in Titus 1.3, now is the time that the full gospel in Christ has been manifested before you. And it's been manifested in the proclamation. The proclamation, the preaching, the proclaiming of the word of God. It's through sacrifice. In Hebrews 9.26, God has manifested himself and made himself known through eternal life. 1 John 1, 2 says, And the life, Christ's life, the incarnate Christ, was manifested. And we have seen and we testify and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was now manifested to us. The giving of eternal life is a display of God's glory. It's him making himself known no other way than Christ. Christ is the full, complete revelation of the glory of God. It is all in him. That's why in every way we look to him in all things, because he is our life. God manifests and make him, makes himself known through his love. 1 John 4, 9. He manifests himself and makes himself known to all people in creation. Romans 1, 19 and 20 says this. Paul says, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen. Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Amen. <clears throat> Every man has no excuse because God has displayed his glory in all things. Not just his, his word revealed, but in all creation. The invisible power, his eternal power and his divine nature. And it's by his works, John 9, 3, Jesus answered and said, it was neither, and, and, and the, the issue at hand here is the man that was born blind, that Jesus opened his eyes, and he went out proclaiming Christ, and the Pharisees brought him in. They were going to put him out of religious worship. But, they, but the disciples asked later, <clears throat> was this man born blind because his parents sinned or because he sinned? And Jesus says it, it was neither. This man, nor his parents, sinned. But this man was born blind, Jesus says, so that the works of God might be displayed. The same word, manifested. In him, in his life, through the miracle that took place. That, that sounds really foreign to us. Because we, we, we don't look at tragedy the way God does. But we should. Why did this man go? And he was an adult at this point. Went his entire life blind. With this disability. So that the glory of God would be displayed. Folks, why have you gone through every tragedy in your own life? Your own circumstances? <laughs> I submit to you this morning. It is for the display of the glory of God. But if we don't see it, we don't recognize it, we won't praise him for that glory and proclaim that glory to everyone we meet. Point number two this morning, God manifests and makes himself known in the riches of the glory of the mystery of Christ. And, and, and just very simply and shortly, he does this. I look at a couple of passages First and foremost, he does it as 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10 says. But now has been revealed or manifested by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 
the first riches of glory and the mystery of this Christ is that death is removed. We no longer have to fear death. He is life. He is the resurrection and the life. And he's revealed it to us. He's revealed it to all mankind. 1 John 3, 5 through 8 says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of of the devil. The riches of the glory of Christ removes the sting of death and it removes the power of sin. Satan's head has already been crushed. Amen. First Peter 1 verses 20 and 22 or 20 and 21 says this. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world that is Christ, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Who did he do this for? For those who believe in God. Back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. Paul says, but has now been manifested to the saints to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Folks, God's manifestation of the riches of Christ are for his people alone and nobody else. We need to understand that the saints, the holy ones, the, the separated ones, the ones that God has set apart for himself, that's who the riches are for. This is a special, exclusive privilege. There are some things that God keeps to himself. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things he's revealed are for us and to our sons and our daughters. There's things that God, that God keeps to himself, but there's, and then there's things he reveals to everyone, such as creation. God has made himself known so that there is no excuse. Everyone can see that. But then there are things that God only reveals to his people. As 1 Corinthians 2 tells us, these things, these spiritual truths, they're spiritually appraised. The natural man does not understand the things of God. Because they're spiritual and they can only be spiritually discerned. And only those who have the spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, can fully understand these riches. And only understand these riches of glory. But notice to the Gentiles. Going back, we looked over the last several weeks, reminded you, God's always plan was to manifest himself to the nations. He promised Abraham not only physical descendants, but he promised him that all the families of the earth in him would be blessed or through his line. That's us. The Gentiles. All the nations. Again, a confirmation of that covenant promise from our covenant keeping God who does exactly what he says how he says he's going to do it every time in every way. That's the surety of our hope. That's the surety of these riches in Christ, of this mystery. It's not a mystery anymore for those who are in him. It's glory. It's radiance. It's magnificence. Do we respond to it that way? As I say so many times, the salvation of Christ is not just getting out of hell. That's not what it is. That's not why Christ came. Christ came to restore. He came to redeem. He came to reconcile. He came to give eternal life. Thirdly, it's manifested through us. God manifests and makes, makes himself known to us 
But now it's in us. He says, Paul says, it is Christ in you. Not outside of you, but in you. And how does he do this? He does this. He reveals himself. He manifests himself through several things. I only have four, but there's many more. But the first thing is knowledge. 2 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. <coughs> Those in Christ can know God intimately and deeply. Paul calls it here a sweet aroma precious gift. Secondly, he, Christ in you is managed for our deeds in God. John 3.21 But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been brought or wrought in God. <coughs> Folks, our life in Christ is a manifestation of his glory. A making known of the riches of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.10 speaks of the life of Jesus within us. Paul says, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Our heart, our body, all of us manifest God. Fourthly, the love of God. 1 John 4.9 by this, the love of God was manifested in us so that or that in this way, God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Through him and him alone. The Christian life is a life of the manifestation of the love of God. It should be pouring out by everything that we do. And we say. Fourthly, it's not just present, the manifestation is future. There's still more manifestation to come, a future manifestation. And we see that in that last phrase of uh, <clears throat> verse 27 Christ in you, the hope of glory. What will be manifested in the future? More of God. More of Christ. Revelation 15.4 says, speaks of the righteous acts of God. The praise being heaped on God, the Lord God. And Revelation 15 says, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. <laughs> There's some really cool stuff coming, y'all. Some real great glory that's going to be displayed. Is, it that our, is that our expectation? Is that our hope? Is that what we long to see? We'll wrap around this in a second, but, but I'll kind of go ahead and bring it up. All of our life is to manifest the glory of God. We glory in our old life. Not in what it was, but the fact that it's been redeemed. Knowing that God willed to reveal himself to us to redeem a people for his own possession. He manifests his glory throughout your life if you'll just look and see it. Because by the means of that, he brought you to Christ and he manifests his glory in your now present life, your new life in him. And he will do it through the rest of his righteous acts one day when we are with him in glory. We will see him and know him fully forever. Later on in this letter of Colossians chapter 3 verse 4, Paul says, When Christ, who is our life. Let me add something there. Not add to the scripture. Don't stone me. When Christ, who right now is our life. Not will be, but is now. That's important for us to understand and grasp. He's our life now. When he is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. We share the manifestation of glory of Christ. Isn't that great? 
1 John 2, 28. John says, Now little children abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Life in Christ right now, that future hope, is to give us confidence to press on now. Folks, it's a certain surety. The victory is already done. Remember at the beginning when I talked about the oneness of God. The victory is already done. It's certain and it's secure and it's set and nothing can change it. That should give us great confidence to move forward in this Christian life. No matter what we suffer or no matter what we experience. 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. That should be our hope, our goal, our drive to be conformed to the image of Christ now. As, as one really old theologian said, I want to live in such a way now that at the time of my leaving this world for the next, the only thing that changes is my clothes. We will be like him when we see him. 1 Peter 5, 4, And when Christ, or when the chief shepherd appears, we will receive the unfading crown of glory. We have confidence. We have conformity. And we have a crown. All to come. All to be manifested at this glorious second appearing. But I want to take a note that God, the focus of this morning's message primarily is that he manifests himself to his people. But he has also manifested himself to others, but in not good ways. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. There is a manifestation of judgment coming. And every person on the planet will give an account for his life, the entirety of his life, every thought, every word, every action. Everything will be given an account. But, God's manifest, but God will manifest himself to those one day who are not his in wrath and in judgment. All of God's glory is displayed. God's wrath is just as glorious as his love. Just as full and complete as all of his attributes are. 1 John 2.19 speaks of those who left the church, the Antichrist. They went out from us, John says, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown or manifested that they all are not of us. The church is filled today with goats and sheep, with wheat and tares. Goats and tares, they come and go. And it's manifested that their life is not in Christ. They are not of us. They are not of God. But as I read Romans 9, verses 22 through 26 this morning, or earlier, before the message, I want to go back to that. I want to end on that note because we need to understand something. Those who are not in Christ. What if God, Paul says, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, Manifesting his fullness. Willing to do that, he endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. God's glory will be manifested in your life, whether you're his or not. If you're his, it is riches and glory. 
If you're not, it is the wrath of his punishment. His justice will be displayed. All of God will be displayed. So for the lost, there is a warning. But for the believer, there is hope and glory. And he did so, Paul continues, to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. That's why Paul's wonderful proclamation back in Colossians 1, verse 28, the next verse that we will look at next week, Paul declares, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. God's manifested glory will be complete. We should want to be complete. Is God manifesting himself to you? Has God manifested himself and made himself known to you this morning? If he has, how has he done it? And I ask that question because I, we need to be contemplative. We need to be meditative on what God has done always. You can't exhaust this. Every single nanosecond of your life can be dissected to see the glory of God. And this leads to further contemplation. And contemplation of the works of God, the glory of God, has one destination, and that's worship. It leads to worship. God manifesting himself in your life. He is. But how is he doing it? And do you understand this morning as God's primary purpose is to manifest himself. He wants us to manifest his glory. And to make him known to all the earth. Where do you find yourself this morning? Has God manifested to you? And are you manifesting him? Or do you find yourself on the outside? And the only way you will manifest the glory of God is when his wrath is poured out upon you. But it doesn't have to be that way. There is hope in the manifested riches of glory of Christ. The gospel that his glory can be shifted in a sense as we can understand it from wrath to blessing. Where do you find yourself today? There's only two options. But today is the day of salvation. And today is the day for confirmation. Conforming deeper into the image of Christ. How are you going to respond? How are you going to respond today? The word of God demands a response every time you come to it. Don't leave today in wonder. Don't leave today thinking you're neutral, because you're not. You either are or you're not. But let's be church, body of Christ. Let's be manifestors of God's glory. Let's be those whose purpose is that of our Savior to make him known. There's nothing better. There's nothing greater. There's nothing more joyful than that. Let's be that today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done, for what you're doing, and for what you will do. Lord, I pray today that your people would respond to your truth, 
in a manner that pleases you. Father, I pray for any heart here that does not know you, who at this moment your wrath is upon. I pray that you would reveal to them the glory of your great salvation. That you would adopt them as your children to be a part of your wonderful work of displaying your great glory. I ask these things for the sake of your great name and in your great